and um, make sure it is working because now I don't see it popping up on my screen. Hang on a second. It says recording. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, well, as Wade said, my name is Dennis Patton. I work with Johnson County K-State Research Extension. And our job is to provide research-based uh, educational information. And um, composting is one of those ways we've been doing that over the years as uh, regulations on solid waste and waste, organic waste in Johnson County changed a number of years ago with a lot more people getting interested in backyard composting uh, as a way to, uh, to help our, our environment. So, you know, when we start, we have to define, well, what is composting? Well, composting is a natural process. It's been, gone, it's been going on in nature forever. Uh, you know, in terms, it's a biological decomposition of organic material um, by bacteria, fungi, worms, and, and organisms. I think really the most important thing to think about in the whole composting process is, you know, you put dead stuff in it, but if you really think about a compost bin pile being alive, I, I think it really gives you a whole nother perspective on what you need to do to manage and be successful at composting. Uh, because really what composting <laughs> is, is trying to promote um, the organisms the bacteria, fungi, those type of things that actually do the feeding and work and break down the compost. So really composting is about uh, managing those microorganisms. So why do we compost? Well, it helps extend the life of our landfill. Uh, it's a great way to convert uh, waste products uh, from our gardening landscapes and house plants into something valuable. And it's also, you know, a good for our, our, our pocketbooks. You know, we go out and buy compost. That's the best way to improve our heavy clay soils. And when you're getting out there, turning the compost bin, you're out in nature. So, you know, hopefully you're getting a little exercise and a little fresh air. So when it comes down to composting, it really gets down to kind of these uh, building blocks of what it takes to have a successful compost bin. And these are kind of the things that we're gonna cover tonight in this presentation. Uh, we're going to talk about the rules of rot, what it really takes to make compost happen. Uh, that will include this carbon-nitrogen ratio, which uh, my goal is to simplify that as much as possible. And then it's really all about taking care of those compost workers. So those are those microorganisms that we talked about. And then I think the last take-home message is that I think composting, you, you need to do it because you want to. Uh, you know, composting can be as um, intensive and you can put as much into it or you can be very lazy at composting. I'm going to use the term hot, cold, active, passive several times and no matter what you do, you pile it up, it's eventually going to rot. It's going to turn into compost. Really the question is how long does it take to get into compost and that's where uh, this whole issue of, of managing uh, the pile comes into play. So when we look at the, the five rules of rot, what we're really talking about then is this whole concept of mass particle size, so how big is the material we put into it. Here again, carbon nitrogen ratio, which is really when you hear people talk about greens and browns, this is really talking about what you put into the pile to make compost from. And then we're gonna talk about moisture and oxygen, and then the amount of time. Everyone wants to know how quickly do you get compost. So if we really think about this as the compost pile being alive, what these really breaks down to is the mass particle size, the carbon nitrogen ratio is the food for the microorganisms. And of course, just like us, we need moisture, we need water to survive, so do the microorganisms. And just like us, we need oxygen, so do they. So really what it is, like I said, is just managing this, this living pile, this mass, to help it break down and facilitate the breakdown. So rule number one is back to this particle size. So basically what this is saying is the smaller the pieces you put into the compost pile, the quicker it's gonna break down. The coarser, the larger material, the longer it's gonna to take to break down. And what it's also saying is that you've gotta have enough mass, enough size 
So the microorganisms have a place to live and work. So really the minimum size is kind of about three foot by three foot to maybe five foot, which well fits within the city's guidelines for size. Uh, because like I said, you need that critical mass, the heat up to get those organisms working. Um, and then when it comes to composting, we'll, we'll mention this several times, there's kind of two philosophies of how to make a compost pile. One is you just keep stockpiling or just keep throwing the materials into the compost bin and eventually it breaks down on the bottom. And the other way to make compost is kind of like what I call the recipe or baking a cake method, the batch method. And that is you kind of stockpile your materials, set it aside, build a bin at one time and manage that one pile as opposed to continually adding to that pile. And we'll touch on that a little bit more. But like I said, there's multiple ways to, to compost and we all get the same in, in the results. So then the second part is kind of really what goes into the compost pile. And this gets back to that carbon and nitrogen ratio, what we call greens and browns. So basically think about the browns as really what the microorganisms, the decomposers eat. And the greens are kind of the food that feeds them to eat rapidly or eat more browns. And so the browns are usually what I think of as dry materials, uh, leaves, straw, paper, wood chips, sawdust, pine needles, those type of things. Uh, usually they're, they're dry, usually they're brown. And then we think of the greens as something that has moisture into them. So fresh grass clippings, uh, vegetable peelings, waste, uh, coffee grounds, tea bags, uh, any type of manure. Um, we'll talk about no dog and cat, hair, eggshell, uh, wood ash are a few of the greens. One of our challenges with composting here is we tend to get a lot more browns out of our landscape than we get greens. So sometimes finding those greens can be a challenge. Uh, the other issue is we get a lot of them in the fall with fallen leaves. Major issues uh, in Roland Park. It's a mature city with a lot of mature trees. And so you get all these leaves in October, November, but then you're not getting any green. So how do you manage that? To, uh, to kind of balance and make that process happen. We'll touch on that again in a second. So there are kind of a few things that you may want to avoid composting. Uh, as I said, really, um, wait, you have some questions. A couple questions from the group. Is it okay to pull weeds from your garden and are those, to find it, those fine to throw into your compost or would it take too long to decompose? If not, cut or mulch them up. So weeds are, are a great question. Yes, I would put weeds in my compost pile and if they're fresh, they would be considered a green. The only exception to that would be if they're full of seeds. And so if they've gone to seed, I would avoid putting them in a compost pile because no composting process is gonna sterilize. And then you run the risk of pushing more uh, weeds back into your garden. How about charcoal ashes from a barbecue grill? Are they okay to put into the compost mm -hmm. pile? Yes, they would be. Yes, make sure they're cold so you don't start any fires. But yes, they would be, and they would be more of a carbon. They would have some nitrogen in them. Uh, but yes, um, and I think the the other caution would be not to have you know predominantly charcoal, but mix it in with with mixed things. And I think that's one of the tips to success with composting is a mixture of materials to get the right 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 amount in there. And a follow up on that. If you only use, say, leaves and grass clippings, is your compost deficient in certain nutrients or is it important to include more variety? You know, that is a really great question. And, and uh, sometimes I touch on that in my com uh, comments later on, but I'll go ahead and say it here. You know, a lot of times people think, and let me go back to the slide of what to put into it. If you're just putting a lot of browns in there uh, and not a lot of, of nitrogen sources, then your compost will not be very nutrient rich. Um, if you use a lot of the compost and the processes of the greens, then you will get more nitrogen in there. What I usually tell people is whatever nutrients you get out of compost situation is consider them more of a bonus than actually probably really enough nutrients to fertilize your plants. Unless you have like, you know, in Roland Park, you have backyard chickens, you might have rabbits, those type of things where you're getting some of those manures that are gonna add a lot more green, then I think you would have a more nitrogen rich compost. The, the other fallacy sometimes about compost is it tends to be high pH when we're making it out a lot of leaves. 
So a lot of times people think they're going to acidify their soil by adding compost they make and sometimes they end up raising the soil pH and we already tend to have a high pH in this area. Okay. Cool. So, so yeah, raise your hand. That's a great way. Keep, uh, keep on, keep the questions coming. So kind of things not to, to decompose, you know, large branches, limbs, it's just going to take so long, they will break down, uh, but you could also chip them, use them for mulch, those type of things. Uh, also really woody perennial stems here again, unless you chop them really fine, they take long to break down. And then kind of along the lines of not putting uh, weeds with seeds in the compost pile, we try to avoid diseased vegetables also, because here again, that could transmit some vegetable or diseases to your uh, garden when you use the compost pile. And we avoid kind of the dog and cat or, or, or human pet waste um, because it tends to potentially have some disease issues uh, that could spread to a human being. Uh, so we don't use those in a backyard compo compost pile. You know, you can uh, do the bury in the hole method. So what you're basically doing is digging a hole in your backyard as you pick up the, the pet waste, you just drop in a hole, cover it up from time to time. When it fills up, you dig another hole and you compost it that way. And uh, Wade's already said that, you know, the fatty foods, those type of things are against codes. Uh, the reason being in a home uh, compost pile is that they tend to potentially attract some, some varmints in there. And the other tip I might give you, I'll say this later, if you use a lot of food scraps, so uh, example would be you're preparing a, a salad for dinner, the lettuce, you know, that kind of goes to the wayside, that can go in the compost pile. But if it's got salad dressing on it, that probably doesn't need to go in the compost pile. And if you do a lot of vegetable scraps in your compost pile, my advice to reduce the chance of possums and those type of things is to bury it into the center of the pile so it doesn't become a food source laying on top of the pile. It's just a good way to kind of hide and keep it out of sight. So kind of going back to this carbon nitrogen ratio, you know, in some, I probably should just take this slide out for the geeks in the room that get it, it probably makes sense for the rest of you, it overwhelms you. But basically what this is saying is you need about, uh, you need a little bit more browns and you need greens. One of the classic recipe is you have a couple bags of dried leaves and one bag of fresh grass clippings, kind of gives you that 30 to one ratio. So what this is saying is the denser, the woodier it is, um, the stemmier it is, the more greens it's going to take to balance that out and break it down. And the other tip I give, if you don't have a lot of greens, the easiest way to add nitrogen to the compost pile is through the use of garden fertilizers. So you can use organic products like blood meal, alfalfa meal, composted manures, or you can even use regular man-made chemical fertilizers too. I know some organic people might kind of bristle at that a little bit, putting something uh, non-organic into the compost pile, but it does break down, releases the nitrogen that feeds uh, the microorganisms to get this carbon nitrogen ratio. Uh, in fact, it's an easy, fairly inexpensive way to, to boost the, the activity of a compost pile is by adding, you know, it's real scientific, just throw a handful every, every once in a while into those leaves when you're putting in the compost pile and, and it works. You know, and, and if you know you've got the, the ratio off, if it smells, that probably means you're, you're rotting, you've got too many greens, uh, and so add browns to it. If it's not smelling, then you probably don't have too many greens uh, in the compost pile. Uh, in fact, it may not be, may not be working because you don't have enough greens. So the next rule of rot, it gets back to moisture, and yes, Wade, uh, a couple of quick questions before we get to moisture. Uh, question, I've heard conflicting things about using dryer lint. Yes or no? Uh, if you're using only for or, or cotton or wool? Dry, dryer lint could be used in the compost pile. It, it, the problem is if you got a lot of it and you do have a lot of uh, synthetic fabrics, it, that may not break down, but those are so minute fibers, I wouldn't worry about it. So I would, I would add dryer lint to the compost pile. Okay, how about greens off of a bush or uh, tree trimmings? Are they okay for the pile? They would be fine. The only exception would be if they're really stemmy or woody, then they're gonna take longer to break down. So you might wanna chop them a little bit finer. 
Okay, thank you. Cool. Okay. So then the next rule of, uh, of rock for composting and for excess is, is moisture. And if I had to say, if there's two reasons, main reasons why a compost pile fails, uh, and by fail, I mean doesn't break down as rapidly as you want to, is the probably the number one, it's too dry. And uh, number two is there's not enough greens. And so those are the two tips for speeding up composting. If you're really an active, hot composter, as you're building the pile, you'll have a, a garden hose of water running next to it. So you collect all your leaves in the fall. Uh, you got them set to the side. You turn your water on. You start adding your leaves to the compost pile. And you're wetting those leaves throughout the entire pile. So you've got inside out or outside in, whichever term you want to look, you've got water moisture throughout. Because here again, just like we need water to drink, so are those microorganisms. How do you know? Water well, take a handful, wring it out, and as this slide says, you almost want it to feel like a damp sponge. Uh, and if it's too dry, it, it's just going to set there. It, it's not going to rot. Um, so if you're really an active composter, you'll water the compost pile through the process to speed it up. And the next kind of rule is oxygen. And, and this one's kind of a no-brainer. Um, you know, Composting is aerobic. We've got oxygen in there. That's why we don't have a smell. That's how the microorganisms are working. Anaerobic, you know, a landfill is anaerobic. It doesn't have oxygen. That's why it doesn't break down. Uh, it's not an efficient way of composting. But here again, we're talking about microscopic organisms. So we're not talking about big pore space. Um, they can get in these little cracks and crevices between the shredded material. So in fact, what I'd recommend when you're building that compost pile, like with leaves and those type of things that are really fluffy, is to wet them and get in there and, and pack them down, jump up and down on them, compress them, so you can get a lot more material in that bin. And you're still gonna trap kind of tiny air pockets in there to feed the organisms. And then eventually you're gonna turn that pile, which is gonna put more aeration back in there. So really don't worry about oxygen. It's gonna naturally come, unless you've got leaves that are just kind of layered in there um, it's going to naturally be in there. So usually lack of oxygen is not a problem, unless it's really wet, something along those lines. And lastly, the question is, everyone wants to know, well, how fast am I going to get compost? So it really depends whether or not, here again, back to those terms, you're active, fast composters. So by active, I mean you're actually managing the pile. If it dries out, you're adding water. If it runs out of nitrogen, you're adding more nitrogen. And if you do fast active composting, the pile is going to get hot. It's going to heat up. And we'll talk about that in a second. And it could take anywhere from just a few months to half a year to make compost. And then there's the passive slow composter. And that's basically the person just throws it in there. And you know, hey, I feel like today adding some water to the compost pile. Or, hey, maybe I'll go turn the compost. Maybe I'll never turn the compost. But eventually it breaks down. Remember, it's a natural. And really with this system, it really never heats up. So there's really not a right or wrong answer. It really depends on how you want to manage compost. It really depends on your inputs and labor. The, like a lot of things in life, the more you put into it, the quicker you get something in return. And a lot of times the active composters are gonna be the one that's gonna do that batch method, like I talked about earlier. You're gonna kind of stockpile those materials to the side when you get enough materials, you're going to build a compost bin. You're going to manage it until it's finished. A lot of times the passive composter is the kind that just keeps throwing it in, throwing it in. And then what happens is you get compost at the bottom, but you never have the whole batch done. So you have to kind of scrape out the bottom at the bottom. So both methods works. It just really depends how you want to handle it. Do some questions get generated off of that or not? A question regarding seeds and any type of um, vegetables or pumpkins or anything like that growing naturally <laughs> in the pile? Well, you know, a lot of times when you put vegetable waste in there, a uh, compost pile, it can, can come to life. Um, you know, a couple years ago at our compost pile, our demonstration garden, uh, we put some gourds in there from the previous kind of Halloween Thanksgiving season. The next year, we probably picked two five-gallon buckets of gourds out of our compost pile. So a lot of times people say they get the best cantaloupe, they get the best pumpkins out of their compost pile. So if it happens, just let them grow. If you turn them under, you get more green. So I wouldn't worry about it. It's kind of, kind of, you know, kind of what you want to do with them. 
another question. How about if you have your, your yard fertilized, uh, sprayed for weeds with any type of uh, chemical, should you avoid the grass clippings and compost piles, especially if you excellent. want to keep organic? Excellent, excellent question. If you're going to use grass clippings in your compost pile, I've got a couple of recommendations for you. One would be let the grass clippings fall back to the turf for a couple of mowings after the application before you start collecting them and putting them in a compost pile. That way you're absolutely safe. There is one precaution. There are a couple herbicides out on the market. Um, one that you could use as a homeowner, the active ingredient is called quinforlin. And if you read on the label, it says clearly, do not compost grass clippings. Most of the products, the broadleaf herbicides we use as a homeowner aren't gonna have any problems in the compost bin, but that quincorlac is one that I would be concerned about. And if you have a lawn service, you might wanna check with them to find out what to chemicals they're adding to your lawn and whether or not you should avoid collect, uh, collecting the clippings for uh, composting. Excellent, thank you. Cool. Okay. So when we talk about this hot active composting, what we're really talking about is microorganisms how they feed and how they react. Actually, you know, microorganisms will start feeding when the temperature is below freezing, but the really good efficient ones that really break it down fast are gonna be operating probably in that 100 to 120, 130 degree range. Uh, if we get too hot, uh, then it could start being detrimental to the micro, microorganism population. But rarely in a home composting bin does that happen. But basically, this up, the faster they work, the faster that you get compost is what this is saying. But they're going to work at various uh, degrees, but the most efficient are going to be those higher temperatures. And like I said, I keep talking about these microorganisms. There, there's all sorts of things. Most of them are microscopic. And actually, the compost bin is a food chain. So the, the bigger eats the smaller, and it just keeps on moving up the food chain till you get to things you can see, like uh, earthworms and uh, some grubs and some other things that come in. But really, most of these are done by microscopic bacteria, fungi that you never see. You could, you know, turn into a compost pile and you could see all this little white stringy material strands going through there, which would be the mycelium of these, uh, these bacteria, fungi that are actually feeding on breaking down uh, the, the compost itself. So basically, kind of the slide, slide kind of says the same thing. If you see earthworms, some sow bugs, some snails, some centipedes in there, actually consider those good guys. Uh, they are, they're part of that food chain. That they're working on up and just helping to break down. And uh, keep in mind, you know, kind of good hygiene. You know, if, if you get a lot of, of, of greens in there that you're drawing flies, things like that, then you may want to add some more browns to cover up the pile, turn the pile, those type of things. Or as I said before, you may want to make sure you bury those kitchen scraps uh, so they don't become a, a food source for other animals and things. So when it comes back, yes, wait. Does adding earthworms help or does it need a specialized worm? Great question. So, you know, I make this comment when I do composting process uh, uh, presentations. I kind of harken back to the, the old Iowa baseball movie and, and Field of Dreams. And what's that famous line from that movie? You build it, they will come. And that's exactly the same way with the compost pile. So no, you do not need to add earthworms. Uh, if you go out on the market, you're going to find what they call these compost starters, compost activators. And you don't need those. All those really are are dilute fertilizer source and you've got cheaper fertilizer in your garage or other sources than using these activators. The, the bacteria, the microorganisms, everything are already there on that dead material and they're just waiting to be fed and watered and they're going to start working. So no, and, and the earthworms you buy, a lot of those red wigglers and things aren't going to be ones that survive outdoors in our, our climate and um, if the compost process is healthy enough, they're gonna, they're gonna be there. They're gonna show up. They're gonna come up through the soil and then start reproducing in your compost bin. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to have too many insects? Uh, in, it, is it too possible? Well, if you use insects in the bad terminology, yes it is. 
<laughs> use insects and that they're beneficial helping to break down the compost process, then no, you really can't have too much. Uh, I told the story when I did this last time at our compost bin here at the office, we used to save all the coffee grounds uh, from the vending machines and, and use our compost pile. And I have never seen so many earthworms in my life as what was in those, those coffee grounds. You could take up a ball of, of those coffee grounds and it was just crawling with earthworms breaking down that compost. Uh, eventually they went away as the composting process finished, but here again, that's part of the life cycle of, of a compost mm -hmm. bin. So ants, every, any type of insect pretty much yeah. is okay? Ants are okay. You don't usually, sometimes ants will build nests in compost piles, but if you keep turning it, working with it, they should go away naturally, uh, not to the point where they're going to be troublesome or, or be an issue with you. They should not be. If you're getting okay. a, a nest in there and you're probably not managing the pile frequently enough, and, and that could lead to some, some ants getting in there. But in the big picture here, again, they are, they're, they're scavengers, they're decomposers. They clean up waste. Okay, thank you. Cool. So what this slide's basically saying is if you're an active, fast composter, it, it has a life cycle. So if you make the cake batch recipe I talked about and you do all the things right, you got the right amount of greens and browns, you put the water in there, you build the pile, within a few days, that temperature is going to skyrocket. It's going to go to 100, 140 degrees. That's what you want to have happen. That you know you've got efficient composting. Now, how do you know if your compost bin hits 100, 140 degrees? Well, there's a couple ways. One, you can buy a compost thermometer. You can probe it in there, measure the temperature. You can also stick your hand in there, ooh, kind of disgusting, but if it's hot, you want to pull it out, you know it's working. Uh, sometimes you can put like a, a garden rake or shovel in there. If the metal heats up, you know it's working. And so then in an active hot composting bin, once that cools down, you turn the pile, you add water, you maybe add some more nitrogen and it heats up again. And so what happens is you just get these highs and lows and eventually you, you get compost. Now in a passive, uh, slow composting system, it may never heat up for you. It, so it's gonna take a lot longer. So when people talk about using a thermometer, those type of things, it's really dealing more with this active, hot composting so you can monitor that temperature. And you know you hit your right recipe when you've got that 100, 120 degree temperature in your compost pile. When it drops below 100, you know it's time to turn again. How about the sun? Does it matter as far as how much direct sunlight? You know, uh, there's pros and cons to both. That's a great question. Um, I think in our area with really hot summers, uh, I think I'd prefer to have the compost bin a little bit of shade. And the reason being is that doesn't dry it out as rapidly. Because like I said, lack of moisture tends to be one of our bigger problems. The advantage to having is some sun is that compost bin is going to stay warmer longer into the fall. It's going to start heating up a little bit quicker in the spring uh, as the temperature rise. Uh, to me, either location's fine. I think it really gets back to what's the best location for you. But if you had your ideal situation, maybe some morning sun, afternoon shade to keep, to keep it cooler. Okay, thanks. The other tip on locating the bin is try not to put it in a really wet area either because if that water starts standing, wicking up the bottom, then you can saturate the, the pile and start to get that anaerobic and, and, and get a smell. So you might want it in a, in a well-drained area. Uh, covering it or uncovering it, there's pros and cons to that too. Covering it keeps some of the animals out. Uh, covering it also keeps all natural rainfall out of it. Uh, so most compost bins to be covered uh, unless you have some, some issues with animals, those type of things. So this slide's kind of just more or less uh, kind of reviewing what we just talked about, that, that active hot, you're gonna monitor the temperature, you're gonna turn the piles it cools down, you're gonna keep it moist at all times. Uh, you're probably gonna do that batch method that we talked about, uh, as opposed to the passive uh, cold composter, you're basically, like I said, you're gonna build it, let it decompose, and, and let mother nature do her thing. But that doesn't mean you can't manage it from time to time. I must admit, I probably fall into the more passive, active or passive composter. Uh, I have a couple bins. I put stuff in there. If I think about it, I turn it, I mess with it. Uh, and a lot of times I'm using my compost bin as holding to use that material the following year to mulch my vegetable garden, those type of things. But I'm still diverting that material from the waste stream 
uh, and, and still getting a valuable product out of it. So here again, it's kind of what method suits best for your personality. It's going to happen no matter what you do. It's just how much you want to manage it and how quickly you want it to happen. So if you're doing that batch recipe, you kind of want to do this constructing the pile. So here again, you're layering those browns and greens throughout that pile. So you got that, that mix through there. You'd also be turning that water on throughout that entire pile. So it's just as wet in the inside as it is the outside. Uh, if you're kind of the bat, you know, the, the throw it in there, you know, this is not going to work. The other thing too about this is don't get hung up on this constructing the pile because the first time you turn the pile, this is all shot to, you know, holy heck, it, it's not going to be there. But you're just trying to get as much of that mix throughout that, that pile as possible. And here again, covering with browns helps keep smells down, potentially flies down. Uh, and other varmint from getting into the compost pile. So then the question gets into, well, what does it, yes, Wade? How about paper from uh, a paper shredder? Is it good for- It is great to add to the compost pile. It's a fairly heavy brown, so it's gonna take a lot more greens to break it down. Uh, if you've got like a, a shredder, it's gonna go a lot faster than putting larger pieces of paper in there. Here. But yeah, paper, paper is a great way. Cardboard can be added here again. Cardboard's a, a thicker, heavier material. So the more you tear it up, shred it, um, the, the quicker it's going to break down. Uh, in fact, the, the comment I think came up last time where someone said, even they'll rip up their pizza boxes and things like that and put the compost pile because you can't recycle the cardboard with a little bit of grease on it. Now I wouldn't put a lot of greasy cardboard in there, but certainly that's one way to, to get rid of that, you know, Looking at a person that has pizza every Friday night, that's kind of our family tradition with all those boxes we hate to throw them away, but that's one way to add them. Okay, so copy machine paper is fine, shredded. Copy Doesn't paper is fine, newspaper is fine. All the ink generated today is all soy based, so there's no heavy metals, anything like that that's going to adversely affect our plants. In fact, I can't really think of any household material, you know, waste product, you know, that you're going to put in the compost pile that would be uh, negative to it. I mean, within the of course, yeah. So. Thank you. Okay, so everyone kind of says, what, what kind of bin, what kind of system should I have to compost? And really the bottom line is the bin doesn't make the compost, you do. All the bin the container does is hold the material, keep it neat, keep it organized, um, keep it from being unsightly. And so I think the consideration you look at obviously is size. So we talked about you need a large enough size that your shape doesn't really matter. Uh, design, you know, again, it's aesthetics. Uh, cost, you know, the factor. Luckily, you know, Roland Park's got a cost share program to help you out. Uh, and then, of course, what you like. So if you kind of look at these different ones here, the, the green one with a little door, that's kind of the classic uh, throw it in and keep going system. So the 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 theory is you take the lid off, you get a bag of leaves, you throw it in there. Uh, you can turn it, you can add water, but eventually you lift the little trap door open and voila, there's all that rich compost. Uh, you know, for those recyclers in there, that little wooden, four wooden pallets recycled works great. Um, here again, they decompose over time, but you can get in there, turn that, uh, you can make a batch. Uh, wire, concrete ring wire, you know, make a three, four foot ring circle is a great way. Uh, going down to the bottom, the three bin system, that's kind of the really active, uh, you know, gung-ho composter because here you've got like a holding bin, you've got a bin that you've got to batch in, and then maybe you have a bin that you've got finished compost in ready to use. And the reason I, I, they sometimes, you know, talk about at least three sides is to hold the material. And sometimes four sides are nice too, but you have those removable sides, sometimes it's easier to turn. As you go over to the right hand side, you see the, the, the barrel crank, the couple barrels and that little kind of bullet that shakes back and forth. My take on those, they're much more costly. They don't make compost any faster, any better than any some of the less expensive ones, but they do hide it, keep it neater, out of sight, those type of mines. The main disadvantage of those is lack of water. No rainfall is gonna get in there. You've got to hydrate those uh, to keep those uh, going and making a system. So here again, those are also the fat system. So you fill it up, 
you make a batch, you empty out the compost, you make another batch. If you keep adding to that, it's gonna be very hard to separate out your finished compost. So then the other question is, well, when, when is my compost finished? When do I make compost? And there's really no textbook definition of when compost is done. It's more subjective. I think the best answer is when it doesn't look like what you put in there any longer, it looks more like soil, then I would call it compost. So, you know, finished compost usually is dark in color, has a rich earthy smell, it's light and fluffy. Uh, the other thing about composting, because there's different thicknesses, um, coarseness uh, to materials. Sometimes not everything in that batch is done at the same time. So some people will get what they call a compost screen, which is nothing more than a mesh wire, maybe uh, put over a two by four square frame. And then you pour the compost, maybe set that on top of your wheelbarrow, pour the compost in, take your hand or shovel, kind of rake it through so the finished compost falls through. Then if you have sticks and twigs and things that's not broken down, you can put that into the next batch of compost and you continue to, to go. Um, if you don't have finished compost and you use it in the garden, sometimes it can tie up the nitrogen in your garden as it continues to break down, just like it ties up the nitrogen during the composting process. And the thing I mentioned, that nutrient comes back to you at the end. It's not lost, it's just returned after the microorganisms are done feeding. You're still gonna have a lot of microorganisms in the finished compost, process. And that's another reason why it's good to add to the soil because that boosts your microorganism population, good, good fungi bacteria in the soil itself. So why, why compost? What's the benefits of compost? Well, most of you in our area know that we have extremely heavy clay soils. And really, the additional organic matter is the only way really to break up that bond, that hole that clay has on each other, so it becomes easier to till and work with. It also helps improve drainage or aeration in our soil, so clay soils hold a lot of water when it's wet, which can ex exclude, excuse me, which can exclude oxygen from the root system of the plants, and that helps um, increase drainage, uh, which increases aeration. Uh, it also helps hold water too. I mean, compost has this ability to hold water, but yet let water drain through. That's kind of the miraculous thing about it. Uh, and so it then it makes that soil sometimes easier to take up water because it's not crusted over the clay. So you get better uh, infiltration, less runoff. We've already talked about increasing fertility uh, of nutrients, minerals, those type of things. But like I said, keep in mind, it may not be your only fertilizer source you need. I said, you still get those beneficial microorganisms going into the soil, whether you're passive, hot, uh, cold. You might get a little bit more from the passive, if it's really hot. You, you may, uh, those are not gonna live as well in the soil if they're really functioning at 100, 140 degrees is what I mean by that. So troubleshooting the compost bin as we kind of wrap this up. Um, it's really simple, you know, if you got a rotten odor that's probably telling you you got too many greens, could also be too wet. So you add browns, turn the pile, that aerates it, spreads out that moisture. You get an ammonia smell, that's probably too many greens. So you put a lot of fresh grass clippings into your compost pile, then turn the pile, add browns here again, dry it out, aerate a little bit. Uh, if the temperature of the pile doesn't heat up, so, here again, we're back to probably adding water, adding greens, and, and the pile. So this would really be for those hot, active composters if you just can't get the temperature up. Your problem is you probably, like I said, not enough nutrient, not enough nitrogen, not enough water. And if you start to get a lot of pests, then you might want to look at what materials you're putting in there, especially fatty foods, those type of things, or here again, cover those food waste. And another tip for those that, uh, do save their food waste, their organic food waste, like their vegetable peelings, potato peels, those type of things. Instead of running out to the compost pile every time you prepare a meal, what they call a composting bucket under their sink. Or what I like to do, but you gotta have space for this, is I just kept a bucket in my freezer, in my refrigerator stairs. So if I um, you know, peeled potatoes, you know, prepared a meal, lettuce salad, 
I'd get that composting bucket out of the freezer. I'd put the materials in there. I'd let it freeze. Then when I take it to the compost pile, it's already pretty much broken down into mush. So it's less attractive to animals. And it's also pretty much decomposed. And also it stopped me from running to the compost pile every day with my, with my materials. So it's really kind of up to how you want, want to handle it. So like I said, composting may not be for everyone or composting is just part of a strategy to help reduce organic matter uh, going off site. So, you know, I don't, I don't catch grass clipping. I mulch mow, I let them return to the soil. So right there, I don't have a green source to compost because rarely, rarely. Uh, mulch mowing returns about a third of the nitrogen fertilizer back to the lawn and garden. Uh, if you want to catch your clippings, uh, you can use it as mulch and don't have to compost. Uh, you can mulch mow leaves back into the, the lawn. Uh, research has shown you can mow safely six to eight inches of leaves back into the turf. Now, that does not mean waiting till you have eight inches of leaves on the ground. What it basically means when you have a light covering of leaves, you're going to mow the yard. So when those leaves start coming down, all those big oak trees in Roland Park in the fall, you're going to mow based on how many leaves cover the lawn as opposed to how quickly the grass grows. So in a mulch mowing system with a lot of tree canopy, you could mow that yard technically every day, uh, as long as you're still chopping the leaves, they're rough, going back into the soil, um, then you can let them just lay on the lawn itself. The other thing I like to do if leaves get away from me, I will take my bagging attachment off the mower, uh, mow kind of helter skelter, let the leaves chop, then the second time I'll come back through, I'll put my bagging attachment on, I'll catch the leaves, because the first time you mow leaves, the bagging attachment just sucks the leaves up whole into your attachment. But if you let them chip and shred, you can probably greatly reduce the bulk of leaves by doing that double mowing. And then you've also got those leaves chopped and ready to go in your compost bin or the uses mulch in the landscape. And like I said, we already talked about woody debris, those type of things uh, as mulch too. So if you want more resources on composting, uh, our website is here. Uh, if you go out to our composting, there's probably about half a dozen different videos we've made on composting. We've got a couple fact sheets. You're always welcome to call our Extension Garden uh, Master Gardener hotline or send us an email. And if you really love composting, I cannot highly recommend the Rodale Book of Composting to you copies at the public library. I think you can still buy them online. And it was, it's been probably printed 30, 40 years ago, but it still has all the science behind composting. I really brushed over the science of composting. So this is for those diehard composters. I jokingly tell people, also if you have insomnia and can't sleep, you may want to pick up a book, uh, the Rodell book to composting. Because it's, it's dense. It, it, it's a dense, it's a dense read. So I'm gonna summarize, then we'll get into questions if that's okay here. So here's kind of the whole, whole evening in a nutshell. So you can take 20, 30 bags of leaves you would collect in the fall. Here again, mulch, mow them, chop them up. You build your compost pile, you get the water running. As you can see in the lower left there, you get in there, you stomp those down, you compact those with that water. You add your greens as you're building through. Uh, build a pile, keep it wet, keep it turned, and you're going to have fresh compost to enjoy at the end of the process. Remember, the, the more you put into it, the quicker you're going to get results. And so really, composting without any following rules is better than no composting at all. Like I said, composting has happened in nature since the dawn of time. Uh, whatever you do is going to make it happen quicker. And I think it's got to be something you enjoy doing. Uh, you know, a lot of people who like to compost, it's the challenge of figuring out the process and making it work that they enjoy as well as the benefits itself. And so really composting is a science, but I like to say it's an art. And the art is figuring out the science. That is figuring out what works for your situation. And like I said, rot happens. So really it's this you doing your part to make composting 
happen. So Wade, other either questions you have or we can open it up to um, questions that, that other people have too. Either. I've got a few questions here towards the end. If, uh, if you use finished compost in household plants, will the organi organisms be a problem? Is there a way of avoiding bringing the bugs inside? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, usually by the time you get to the point of it being finished compost, a lot of what I would call the larger, you know, the, the earthworms, the uh, roly polies, those type of things, are probably gonna be void in the compost. So you're not gonna really be bringing those inside. And the, the bacteria, the fungi, the small guys, those are good guys. So those are gonna help your plants. So I wouldn't really worry about that. That may also be where the sifting comes into play, where you can sift out, get the better stuff for, you, for your plants. Personally, I'm not a big fan of using uh, homemade compost in uh, house plants, indoor gardening, because it still maybe not doesn't have the correct balance of air exchange, uh, pH. I think it's better to use that homemade compost outdoors and then buy a, a commercial potting mix made for house plants. Okay. How about a tumbler model uh, composter? Would that be okay if you're going to passively compost or would that not be ideal? It would be fine for passive too. Um, the problem is it's going to take a really long time to break down unless you're putting some water in there. If you're just putting dry materials in there, never adding water, you know, sun rays aren't breaking it down, rainfall is not breaking it down, microorganisms aren't going to get in there, so it's going to be very long time. Uh, it might also help the first couple times you use one of those tumbler composters is either throw a couple shovel full of garden soil in there or maybe put some existing compost in there uh, and kind of jumpstart it with the microorganisms because they're, they're not going to be able to crawl in through the ground, if that makes sense. So you might mm -hmm. want to bait, bait one of those tumblers first and then after you get it going, uh, always leave a little bit of finished compost in there to jumpstart the next batch. Um, I, I think those work better if you do more management to it. Mm -hmm. Can you give a few stats on how much food waste goes into landfills? on average in the United States and how we can help bring awareness to newbies uh, to, to do it? Uh, you know, there's a couple of our Johnson County 4-H'ers uh, participating in this uh, uh, call tonight, our session tonight, who's working on food waste. I believe it's something about a third of all food in the United States is wasted. Uh, a lot of that does up at the landfill. In fact, I've talked to our environmental department here that manages the landfill, and actually food waste is probably one of the predominant in our Johnson County landfill uh, and a lot of that could be diverted uh, and there are commercial landscapers or excuse me composters around here that are is diverting a lot of food waste from school cafeterias restaurants those type of things and if done properly you know greasy foods can be composted it's just that it's very difficult in a backyard compost pile you know if you're really good at composting then maybe you could start in introducing some more uh, food waste that are uh, greasy uh, in there uh, and work just fine. But for the average person, uh, I think the best way is try to use that food instead of getting it wasted in the first place. Mm -hmm. How about using old moldy bread or rice left from uh, over leftover sushi? That would be fine. Yeah, as long as it, as long as it does have a fat or oil on it. That's really the main is the fats or oil. So, you know, you, you, you put salad dressing on the lettuce, no. You put mayonnaise on the bread, no. Um, you get meat in the bread, no. But if it's moldy bread, rice, cereals, those type of things, sure, go right ahead. To me, it's really the, the, the fat is the issue. Uh, somebody posted a statistic that 150,000 tons of food is wasted every day. Yeah, the amount of food waste in the United States of America is just staggering. Staggering. Um, that's a whole different topic on, on food waste. Um, yeah, you know, our, our zest to eat perfect food has really uh, created a lot of waste. That's it for questions. Anybody else? Anybody want to come off mute and ask us a question directly?
Thank you guys. This was great. Well, I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. And that way, if anyone's not intimidated, uh,